It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you're with us this morning. So in 1969, there was a phrase that was uttered that marked a victory in our nation's story and at the same time made an indelible mark on human history. And when I say the first few words of this phrase, you will know exactly who said it, and you will know exactly what it's in reference to. Are you ready for the phrase? That's one small step for man. What's the rest of it? Giant leap for mankind, right? Everybody knows that phrase. Everybody knows who said it. Who said it? Neil Armstrong, right? And, and what was he doing when he said that? He was walking on the moon, right? The moon. Everybody knows that Neil Armstrong said it. Everybody knows that he was walking on the moon. And everybody knows who his colleague was who was with him on the moon, right? It was Buzz Lightyear, right? <laughs> oh, Bu Buzz Aldrin. Sorry, Buzz Aldrin. Right, right. Um, but does anybody else, does anybody know who else was part of that mission? There was three astronauts on that mission. There was Neil Armstrong, there was Buzz Aldrin, and then there was the other guy. Anybody? anybody? Is there anybody here who knows his name? We've got a few. What is it? It is actually not a guy named John. It's a good guess. Michael Collins. Somebody in the back said Michael Collins. Yes, a guy named Michael Collins was the third astronaut on the Apollo 11 mission that went to the moon and walked onto the moon. And he's often known as the forgotten astronaut because everybody knows Neil Armstrong. Everybody knows Buzz Aldrin. They were the guys who actually stepped foot on the moon, but nobody knows Michael Collins because he is known as a guy who had to stay behind on the ship. He had a very crucial but overlooked role in the mission, right? The, the mission was in some ways simple, right? I know it was really complex in how they did it, but the idea of it was simple. Fly to the moon, right? That's what they were going to do. Once they arrived at the moon, they were supposed to enter into the moon's orbit and orbit around the moon. And then with them on the spaceship, they had this other vehicle called the Lunar Module, which they titled the Eagle. And so we have this phrase, the Eagle has landed, right? It comes from this mission because when they left their lunar, in their Lunar Module from the spaceship, they got to the moon and it says the Eagle has landed. Once they arrived on the moon, they were supposed to explore the moon, do their moon exploration, take some things from the moon back, get back into their Lunar Module, go back up to the commander, which was the name of their spaceship, and then fly home. And so Michael Collins' role in the mission was to stay in the spaceship and orbit around the moon while the other two guys were down on the moon. And they spent about 21 hours on the moon exploring the moon. You gotta wonder, like, how did they choose who was gonna do what job, right? Did they draw straws? Did they flip a coin? Was it rock, paper, scissors, like, ah, best out of three, right? Like, what did they do? However it turned out, Michael Collins was chose to stay on board. And the result of that was Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong got all sorts of recognition, way more recognition, way more notoriety, way more fame. But what's interesting about Michael Collins is that when he was asked in interviews about his role in the mission, and people say, wouldn't you have wanted to be one of the guys who stepped foot on the moon? He said, undoubtedly, yes. I would have loved to be one of the individuals who walked on the moon. However, with utmost sincerity, I can say that I was thrilled to have the place that I had in that mission. He said, I was thrilled. I was, I was over the moon, if you could say. I know, I know, I know. Because here's the thing, he knew. What he knew was that successful missions require stellar support. Successful missions require stellar support. And it wasn't just that he had to stay in the spaceship and support them, because let's say all three of them walked on the moon, like then what's gonna happen to get back to their spaceship, right? It just like wanders off into space. Like he had a crucial part in supporting them. But it wasn't just him, it was all the people back on Earth, all the grounds crew, all the engineers, all the scientists who got them to that part. 
Because any sort of successful mission has to have stellar support. And that's not true only of space travel. I mean, it's true of all sorts of things. It's, it's true in sports, right? Like on a football team, it's often the quarterback who's thought to be like, ah, oh, like the, the rock star of the team, but he's only as good as his O-line is, right? He's only as good as his receivers. It's true in a theater production. You have the main character, you have the front people, but they're only as good as the supporting cast and the ensemble behind them. It's even true in church, right? Sometimes it's the pastor who's up front on the platform who's speaking who gets all the recognition, but all of this only happens because we have a great staff. We have great volunteers who are back in the booth. We have people who are doing things all over the place that are unseen. A successful mission has to have stellar support. And that's also true in the Christmas story. Right? In the Christmas story, you could say it's this intergalactic mission of sorts. It's Jesus leaving the right hand of the Father in heaven to come to earth, to arrive on earth, to move and walk among us. And we read in John 1 that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. So Jesus is with the Father, and then John uses metaphorical language to describe him as word and light. And later in chapter 1, John carries that metaphor forward, describing how that word and how that light entered our world. Verse 9, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Verse 14, the word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. Now, all the other gospel writers uh, explicitly describe the mission's supporting cast. M meaning, if you go to Luke's gospel, you read about Mary and Joseph and how they traveled to Bethlehem, right? You read about the shepherds who are out in the field watching their flocks by night. You read about the wise men in Matthew who traveled from afar to visit baby Jesus. You read about the angels lighting up the sky. You read about all of these supporting characters, all of this supporting cast, who had a unique role in their part to play in Jesus entering our world. But there's one other character who oftentimes gets overlooked. And in John's gospel, John highlights this character, and his role in the story actually tells us a lot about our role in the story as well. Because in the middle of all this metaphorical language about Jesus being the Word who becomes flesh, being the light that shines in the darkness, we read a few verses about a supporting character named John. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God, whose name was John. So alongside Jesus, in chapter 1, there's another individual named John. And depending on your familiarity with the gospel of John, you might wonder, is this the same John whose name is attached to this story, right? Is that the same John? Bible scholars agree that it's probably not the same John, that this John is a reference to John the Baptist, and the John whose name is attached to the story is one of the disciples of Jesus. And what we learn throughout chapter 1 is that John the Baptist had a very specific role. While he wasn't a part of the supporting cast that was with Jesus at the manger, he still had a significant role. And the function of his role was, as his name states, to baptize people. He came in the wilderness, it says, baptizing people. And the purpose of his baptism was to grab people's attention and help them prepare for the arrival of Jesus in his public ministry. Now, what's interesting about verse 6 is that John the author describes John the Baptist as someone who is sent. There was a man whose name was God, or whose name was John, sent from God. Now, Jesus will also use that same language throughout the gospel to describe himself. All in all but five chapters in the gospel of John, Jesus talks about being sent from the Father. 
which in some ways is a reference to Jesus being sent from this other world reality, right, in heaven with the Father to earth, which is dramatic, right? God leaving. Sometimes we lose sight of that at Christmas time. We, we lose sight of the weight and magnitude of God entering into our world in the form of a baby. And I don't know really how far heaven is away if we were to like classify distance, but it seems dramatic. It seems far. It seems like he traveled this great distance to be with us. And so sometimes when we hear that word sent, we naturally think, oh, that's an equally dramatic word of us because Jesus sent people. And as a church, we send people. We send missionaries all over the place. As a church, we sent missionaries to Colombia. As we mentioned the Goddards this morning, we've sent people to Paraguay. We've sent people to Chad, Africa. We've sent people to the Philippines. We have sent, as a church, we have sent people all over the world. But John the Baptist wasn't sent to another country. John the Baptist wasn't sent to another people group. John was sent to his own people, the people of Israel. He, he didn't go across the world. He went right next door, which means being sent is more about a mindset than it is a location. If you can be sent to the place where you live every day, it means it's more about a mindset. It's more about a posture and an attitude in the way you view the world than it is actually traveling a long distance or traveling to a faraway country. Being sent means you have a burden, a burden on your heart to partner with God in reaching people. It means you have a desire to see the people who live on your block come to know Jesus and learn of his amazing grace in love for them. It means you have something weighty that you carry, some urgency about you to say, like, this is really important, and we have to share this with everybody. I can remember the first time I felt that. Growing up in high school, I worked at a summer camp that um, was actually 15 minutes away from my house. And I would move there for the summer. People came from all over New England to work at this camp. We would stay on camp property for the summer. We all had different jobs. And then at the end of the summer, everybody would go home. It, it was not as a dramatic of a transition for me because some people came from like Maine or New York or whatever. I went 15 minutes down the road in New Hampshire. And so when I came back after my first summer there, I had this amazing summer. I grew in my faith. I made all of these new friends. I began to like have this understanding of what it meant to serve the Lord and reach out to people. And I remember one day I came back. It was like at the end of the summer, and I was walking my, the, the main street. I think I was out with my parents going to get ice cream or something. And I had been apart from that actual location for a better part of two months. And I remember walking the street just like looking at my hometown with like a fresh set of eyes. Looking at my hometown and the people who walk those streets and be like, I wonder if they know what I know. Like, I wonder if they've experienced what I've experienced. I wonder if they see Jesus in the same way that I do. I wonder if they know his love for them. I wonder if they're experiencing his goodness and his grace in their daily life. And what it means to be sent is to have that mindset about you, to, to look at the world around you and ask those questions like, do they know what I know? Have they seen Jesus the way that I have? Have they ever met him or experienced them or have their eyes open to them? So being sent isn't about going a long ways away. It's about viewing the world you live in every day with a certain mindset and posture. And as Christians, we are all called to be sent. Jesus, at the end of the Gospel of John, will say to his disciples, just as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. At the beginning of the book of Acts, when Jesus ascends back to the Father, he says to the disciples, go into all the world and be my witnesses. He says, start right where you are. Start right here in Jerusalem and then trust that I will lead you from there. So that means for us who live in Wauwatosa or the Milwaukee area, 
It means we start right here. Some of you may be called to other places. We've seen that in our church. But for many of us, the call is to be sent right where you are. And the thing we're sent with is a story. The thing that John was sent with was a story. Verse 6 again, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him everyone might believe. Now the theme of testimony is significant throughout John's gospel. You'll see it a lot that it surfaces in terms of somebody testifying about Jesus. And there's no specific definition of what testimony is, but the way John uses it is that it's basically any source that can speak to the reality of who Jesus is and what he is all about. And throughout the, the Gospel of John, you see that there's the source of the Father. The Father testifies about his Son. You see that there's the Spirit who testifies about the Son. There's the Scriptures, which at that point in time would be the Old Testament. They testify about Jesus. There's references to prophets of old who testify. A, a testimony is just simply somebody who can speak to the reality of who Jesus is. Is. And depending on how you count them in the Gospel of John, there are seven or eight different sources who testify about Jesus. And John the Baptist would fall into one of those sources. He would fall into the category of being a prophet, a prophet who was called by God to testify, to speak to the reality of who Jesus was and what he was doing. But as you read through the Gospel of John, the most compelling testimony, the most compelling witnesses are those who had eyewitness experience, meaning those who actually saw what Jesus did, those who actually heard what Jesus said, those who actually experienced his power in their life. And you read stories about them. Chapter 4, there's this woman who carries this unbearable shame, and she orders her life in such a way to avoid people in her daily life who might continue to heap that shame on her. It isolates her from her community. And she's working so hard to minimize it and push it down. She meets Jesus. Jesus exposes her shame, sits with her in it, heals her of it, and then she walks away. She's like, come meet this man who told me about everything I've ever done. It changes her life. And then in chapter 5, Jesus meets a man with a disability who, who is stuck in one spot, has to get carried around, who has this hope of someday being healed by climbing into this pool that when the waters are stirred, there's this myth that maybe it provides healing. And Jesus meets him, and he sits with him, and he heals him of his disability. And this man then goes out and says, this is the guy who made my legs work again. People who see Jesus, experience him, hear him, and have encounters with him, and their lives are changed, go out and naturally tell other people about them. Now, for us, when we think of our own story with Jesus, sometimes our story and our perception of our story with Jesus falls into one of two ditches, right? Sometimes we think, well, our story of Jesus and with Jesus is that moment when I made a decision, some 20 years ago, right? Some 20 years ago, I was at a rally. I was in a church basement. It just made sense to me. Everything clicked and I kind of gave my life to Jesus, right? Sometimes our story with Jesus goes back that far. Or sometimes we think that a story with Jesus and an experience with Jesus is most powerful when it's really dramatic. Like I was a partier, I was living this wild lifestyle, I hit rock bottom, I was destroying everything, and then Jesus turned my life around. But the reality is, Jesus isn't at work in our lives in the past, when we first made a decision for him. Nor is Jesus only at work in our lives in those dramatic, over-the-top, wow, mind-blowing stories. Jesus is at work in our lives constantly. Jesus is always present. He will say that in John 5. My Father is always present, and he's always at work. So I, too, am present and always at work. That means Jesus, yes, is at work in the big things in your life, but he's also at work in the little things in your life. And the question is, can you see him, not only in those big things, but in the little things? Because if you're only looking for him in the big things, you will miss him in the little things, which might be the more frequent things. So for me, just last week, here's a true confession of a pastor. 
one of the hardest times of the year to preach is Christmas. All pastors are like, oh, it's Christmas. What am I going to preach about again, right? It's probably going to be Jesus being born in a manger, right? I did that last year. I did that the year before that. I did that the year before that. I did that the year before that, right? Like it's one of these challenging seasons because you feel like I'm just saying the same thing from one year to the next. And does anybody even remember? Maybe they do. I don't know. But any pastor will say preaching at Christmas is really hard. So last week, last week I'm, I'm in one of those places, and I'm like, okay, we're in John 1. I've preached from John 1 so many times, so many times. In my first year here um, for, for Christmas, I, I used this phrase in one of my sermons, seeing is believing. Does that sound familiar to anybody? If you're saying no, you either weren't here last week, you didn't watch online, or you were asleep while I was preaching, Right? Because that, like, that was the thing I used last week was seeing is believing. And I wrestled all week. I'm like, should I do that? I've used that. It's been years, but I've done that. Should I do that again? Because as a pastor, you also feel like I can't just recycle old content because then I get lazy and then I fall into a rut and then my preaching starts to suffer and it's always got to be fresh and new. So I'm wrestling with this. And in my daily reading... Like I, I, I read Psalms, right? It's kind of just reading through the Psalms every year. It's part of my, my daily Bible reading. I came across this passage in Psalm 35, 135 that says, The idols of the nations are silver and gold, made by human hands. They have mouths, but cannot speak. They have eyes, but cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear. Nor is there breaths in their mouths. And as I was reading that, I was like, hey, that's actually in Psalm 115. Like I'm reading in Psalm 135, but here's something that's also in Psalm 115, which means the Bible writers, the writers of Scripture, they actually repeat themselves. Like, they actually say the same thing twice. And it was this moment of, like, incredible freedom for me. And I know it sounds really, like, trivial and silly, but, like, I sat in my office and I was like, Lord, that, like, this is a great, good gift from you. Like, I don't have to worry about what people think. I don't have to worry about like being lazy and just recycling content and being irrelevant. Like I can step into this moment with confidence, knowing that you are present when your word is spoke, and you'll take care of it. Like it was this really little, simple, almost trivial moment, but it was so encouraging to me in a way that reminded me that God is with us, not only in the big, wow, amazing moments, but he's with you in those little, mundane, almost missable moments in our everyday life. And if we have eyes to see, we will see and experience him. And so the question is, what is your story with Jesus? Does your story with Jesus only include things that he did 10, 15, 20 years ago? Does your story with Jesus only include dramatic transformation in your life? Or does your story with Jesus also include the daily little mundane moments where he is faithful and present? Because I'm convinced that our world needs to see and know that Jesus is present with us all the time. He's at work in our lives all the time. And that then in turn gives them hope that he will be at work in their life all the time. So John was sent John was sent with a story, his story, his experience of seeing Jesus as he baptized him come up out of the water, the dove from heaven, the spirit falling on him and identifying him as the Messiah. And then John knew that his mission was to go out into the world and tell people, that's the guy. He's the one we've been waiting for. So John was sent from God. He was sent with a story. And lastly, John was sent to be a sign. This is what we read in verse 8. It says that he himself was not the light. He came only as a, as a witness to the light. Now, during, Don, John, during John's ministry, people came to him and regularly asked, hey, are you the Messiah? Are you the guy that we've been waiting for? Are you the one that we should anticipate? Because he had all these crowds. He had all these people who were gathering around him, hanging out with him, and John was adamant all the time. He would say, no, 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 I and not the light. Verse 8, he himself was not the light. He came regularly saying, no, 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 I am not the one you're waiting for. The purpose of John's ministry was to not be the light, but was to get people's attention 
for the light. Essentially, John was a sign. Because a sign isn't an end in of itself. A sign is a pointer to something else. Uh, one of the things we often do in the summer is we, we drive back to New England to go uh, visit this camp that I worked at and go visit friends out there. And we always drive down 294 around the Chicago area. And for the last few summers, one of the signs that I have seen driving through Chicago is this sign, a billboard that just simply says, I hate Stephen Singer. Anybody know who Stephen Singer is? And I feel bad for this guy. I'm like, man, somebody really hates him. So much so that they've taken out huge billboard space to tell the world that they hate this guy and they've dedicated a website to it as well. Like either this guy's a poor sucker or he's just a really big jerk and deserves it some way or the other. I don't know. So like for the last couple of summers, I saw this sign as we would drive by and I just one, like one day Becky was driving and I'm like, I have to figure out like what this is all about. And so I Google, I, cause that's the website. I hate stevensinger.com. Turns out, he is a jeweler in the Philadelphia area, and it's just a big marketing ploy to get people's attention. And I'm like, why does he have signs in Chicago if he's in Philly? And all it is is this story that um, husbands hate Steven Singer because they have to spend so much money on diamonds for their wives, right? Like, it's this stupid marketing ploy. But the purpose of the sign is to get your attention and then point you in the direction so that you'll buy from this guy. Because that's what a sign does. A sign isn't an end in of itself. A sign is a pointer to another reality. And that's exactly what John was. He was a pointer to something else. He was a pointer to something greater. He himself was not the light. He came as a witness to the light. And in chapter 3, verse 30, he will say, Jesus must become greater and I must become less. He had this perception and this mindset that yes, he came to get people's attention. He came to start gathering a crowd, but at some point he's going to shift that crowd to Jesus. He must become greater. I must become less. We live in a culture that is obsessed with greatness. Like it's what our country is built on. And people think and often live with the perception of like, how do I become great? Like, I wrestle with this all the time. How do I become great? We have a definition of greatness as like, once people look at me, once people recognize me, once they see what I have done, then I will be great. But the narrative of the kingdom is all about making Jesus great because he is the one who is truly great. And our responsibility, in the same way that John had the responsibility of pointing people to Jesus, is to do the same. To be able to tell them, here's what he's done for me, and here's what he can do for you. And so essentially, what John teaches us is that your story is a pointer to someone greater. Your story is intended to be a pointer to Jesus. And so the question is, how do we do that? Like, how do we step into that where our story actually points people to Jesus? Well, it starts with having a story to tell. Do you have a story to tell? Are you able to name, like, here's what God is doing in my life. Here are the ways that he is at work in my life, and here's what he's teaching me. Here is how he's leading me. And if your answer to that question is, no, I don't. Like, yeah, Brian, I do have a story from 20 years ago. I have that story. Brian, I do have the story of the big dramatic change in my life that happened in the past, but I don't have the story of right now, today. How do I get that story? Well, the way that you do it is you pay attention to your pain. You pay attention to your brokenness. You pay attention to the places in your life that feel uncomfortable and awkward and are scary. Because what you find in the Gospels is that when Jesus comes near to people, it's those who are broken and brokenhearted who are most receptive to him because they know they have no other option in life but then hope that Jesus will do something for them. Oftentimes we want to push our pain away. We want to push our brokenness away. And I think Jesus is inviting us to befriend it, knowing that he'll meet us in it. 
He'll meet us in our brokenness. He'll meet us in our pain. He'll meet us there to bring healing to it. And as you start to pay attention to those pain points in your life, and you ask the simple question, Jesus, where are you in this? If you create that space, he will show up. You know, one of the reasons why um, I think Silent Night is such a kind of overwhelming song for people at Christmas time is not just because of its familiarity, but sometimes in the silence of life, that's where God has space in our life to speak. And this is a time of year that's crazy, chaotic, busy, and loud. And what we need to do is create spaces of silence. And sometimes silence is scary, and we're just quick to fill it in. But the invitation of Christmas is to create that space. Have fun, have parties, go to those things, do those things, buy presents, give gifts, have the big family get together, do all that. But where are you creating silence so you can tend to those places that need to be reformed in your heart, trusting that Jesus will meet you there? And when he does, then you have a story to tell. Here's what he has done for me, and here's what he will do for you. So may you see that you are someone who is sent to the community where you live. May you experience Jesus in those little everyday, mundane, painful moments in your life. And may you use your story as a sign that points to him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. We confess, Lord, that it's easy to be so busy in this season that we don't make space for you. I ask that you, over this next week, as we make our final move to Christmas Eve and Christmas, you would help us rest in your presence, in the stillness of moments here and there, where we can tend to the things in our heart, maybe the expectations that are unmet, the discomforts that we want to push away, the awkwardness that we want to avoid, and we'd be able to sit in it with you to know that you are present. You are always present and always at work. And that we would find in those places the redeeming nature of your grace and your mercy and your love. And may we have the courage to share that with others. We pray this in your name. Amen.